This is Elizabeth Melton. I'm the Public Engagement Director for the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I'm conducting interviews with the Loose Foundation's COVID-19 Emergency Grant Network for the Grounded Knowledge Project. We are meeting in the Fetzer Institute boardroom in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Andrew Davis is our videographer. Today is Friday, June 2nd, and I'm joined by Munir Jiwa. Munir, would you introduce yourself? Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's wonderful to be at the Fetzer Institute. I want to thank the Henry Luce Foundation, of course, for um, the initial grants that we received, um, as well as all this ongoing collaboration, not with uh, just with our community partners and academic institutions, but with each other. So this is a real joy to be together. So I want to start off by um, thanking uh, uh, all of our partners and colleagues um, for making this possible. Um, I'm Munir Jiwa. I direct the Center for Islamic Studies at the Graduate Theological Union. We just uh, celebrated the Graduate Theological Union's 60th anniversary and the uh, Center for Islamic Studies' 15th anniversary. So I came in as the founder. Um, I'm also an associate professor of Islamic Studies and Anthropology. Um, so uh, this grant, which we named the GTU Loose COVID-19 Community Partnerships Grants um, was uh, a way in which uh, really was our effort, again, thanks to the Loose Foundation, to connect with communities at the time of crisis and um, to create academic and community partnerships, but really uh, to uh, think about ways in which we as academic institutions um, ourselves empowered by these various grants could then uh, empower these communities that were already doing uh, so much of the heavy lifting. So um, um, in some ways, they empowered us. <laughs> in most ways, they empowered us uh, really um, to think about the academic community partnerships in more significant ways. Um, and doing it at a time of COVID has been a, a kind of significant learning uh, for us. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, can you share a little bit more about the specific context of how the project started um, in the communities that you were working with? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the um, Luce Foundation also already recognized in us um, at the Center for Islamic Studies a long history of community-engaged work, uh, including their uh, support in helping to establish our initial programs at the center, so including our master's. Uh, degree program in Islamic studies, and then working with us on um, uh, looking at uh, Muslim leadership. And a lot of that work was with communities, um, academic communities and non-academic communities alike. So during this grant, um, we uh, already had significant partners in the Bay Area communities, um, mostly faith-based, uh, but also many related organizations and communities. So we worked with mosques, churches, temples, uh, a lot of different organizations, some of them intentionally interfaith, some of them interreligious interfaith just by the nature of the work that they do together, um, and, and some of them just civic and other organizations that, um, uh, that came together at a time of crisis. So we were able to draw on a lot of the communities we already partnered with, but a lot of new partnerships that emerged as a, as a result. Um, one of the significant things for us was really that when we started with the faith-based communities, there was already a significant amount of work that they are already doing um, and continue to do in, in their communities. So serving the spiritual needs of the community, but the material needs. So the COVID um, partnership grants really allowed us to take the grant that we received from the Henry Luce Foundation and provide it directly to what we had finalized as 18 organizations that we worked with. Um, again, mostly faith-based um, and um, predominantly black, brown, indigenous, and Asian uh, communities, um, and, uh, and many non-faith-based communities as well, but who were working with faith-based communities. So there was already partnerships going on uh, there. Um, some communities, as I said, most communities known to us uh, and that we've partnered with, and many new communities as well. Um, a lot of the initial work, and as we've been reflecting uh, here, you know, during our retreat, the early days of the pandemic, I mean, it brings us all back to 
the early days when we were talking about safety and PPE and food and housing uh, insecurity and um, vulnerable populations, that still exists. But when we were thinking about the duration of, of this grant and where, you know, where we continue to go with it, um, there was a lot of just that immediate support that was needed. Um, so we were able to provide um, some of these micro grants to communities that were already very embedded in their communities, uh, were leading. A lot of these are you know, minority, minoritized communities that are already vulnerable themselves. But the leaders in these communities, despite the hardships they face, are on, uh, on the front lines of, of helping so many other communities. So that was everything from, as I said, um, uh, PPE, uh, providing food, um, shelter, uh, to various groups. Uh, we had people working with um, students who now were homeschooling and didn't have internet access or who were living in intergenerational um, families and who had to be provided spaces to, to be, you know, um, to, to do their work. Um, we had uh, formerly incarcerated um, um, uh, uh, people who were looking for housing and you know how do we do that during a time of uh, COVID where there's all sorts of spatial physical distancing uh, uh, um, issues and the, there was a kind of lockdown right um, uh, a lot of um, food insecurity absolutely uh, and there were a lot of spiritual needs what does worship look like online how do these imams and pastors and other leaders and community members provide spiritual care for their communities. There was a lot of questions around um, bereavement and grief and uh, chaplaincy work that happened. That's often the ongoing work of many of these faith-based and other organizations, um, but it was intensified. Um, so we, we saw that they were taking care of a whole range of the kind of material needs, but the spiritual needs, um, the, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, questions around worship and how do you keep in community at a time of um, uh, physical distancing. So there were, there were a whole range of things that these leaders and these communities were dealing with in a way that was um, so illuminating, partly because of the crisis. It just illuminated the work that they're already doing, but now they're doing it in this crisis mode. So it was um, a very humbling experience to um, not only be reminded of um, often communities that are the most vulnerable, but are doing the most work, community work, right? And so th there was, a, and then of course, the academic partnerships. The academic part of all of this is, is our ongoing work. Um, what does community engaged learning look like when we're reflecting back as we're doing at this retreat? Um, how do we bring that into our classrooms? How do our students benefit from engaging with these communities um, and just to to lift up uh, you know those vulnerable uh, voices um, in our communities yeah that's so important and so with with these specific organizations were they all local to Berkeley more regional in that area or yeah they were they were mostly Bay Area uh, we had uh, happened to have a lot in Oakland uh, we had some in Berkeley but it was Bay Area wide so um, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and they were, as I mentioned, um, uh, some of them were known to us and many um, uh, known to us and then some we hadn't actually worked with uh, so much. So there was, there was an opportunity to learn more about their work and also to have them partner with each other. And many of them did that already, but they now did that in, in this kind of new configuration and in new t uh, pandemic time. So um, there was a lot of part, I'd say the, the one thing that keeps summarizing what we did is partnerships, you know, whether it was partnerships within our institution at the GTU or at UC Berkeley, partnerships, academic, non-academic partnerships, partnerships among the grantees and the organizations and the mosques and churches and temples that we worked with. Um, it was all just partnerships and direct services to uh, a lot of people in need. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like there was such a, you know, particularly from Loose and all these different projects, a kind of global net that then got yes. to kind of 
spider web out almost. Absolutely. Um, and connect Absolutely. lots of people with yeah. one another. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, is there is there a specific story or lesson learned um, that comes to mind from a, mm -hmm. from one of these organizations, like a, mm -hmm. like what was what was their work day to day and things that you learned from um, the organizations that you were able to grant. Yeah, all of them are so special, and yeah. you know we have a <laughs> we have a, a a website that's put to you know some of these stories together, and it's highlighted the work, um, including in some of their own voices um, uh, of of the of the incredible work that that's been done. Um, you know, if I if uh, Lighthouse Mosque in Oakland comes to mind immediately um, in terms of a community that you know. Um, has always been kind of on the front lines of um, of, of doing this uh, work, um, led by predominantly African American uh, Muslim communities, but for all, you know. So this is another real lesson that we've learned: um, is that um, often these um, vulnerable populations, but communities that are often marginalized, um, are often seen on the kind of receiving end of aid or are the ones who are seen as um, the ones in need of, and we never see them as the ones who are providing all these incredible services. So again, Lighthouse Mosque, and I, I could say this for probably most, I could say this for all these organizations, they're amazing, but you know, just to lift up one, the, the work that they were doing from PPE to um, food, providing food and shelter and transition um, housing to uh, working with the formerly incarcerated and the incarcerated, um, refugees, uh, women's shelters, um, you know, providing spiritual care, um, providing technology and school supplies. Um, it was just incredible to see the range of work that's happening, and it's all community-led. So, um, uh, you know, the Emir of the Lighthouse Mosque, uh, who happens to be a doctoral student at the GTU as well, uh, Sundiata Al Rashid. Uh, Sundiata is just an incredible leader and has brought in so many communities together. And one of the things that I've had to rethink in part of is, uh, our ongoing work is when you present in a kind of academic environment. Um, so let's just take the GTU is well versed with theological education and that's what we do and we have seminarians and people are generally very engaged. But if you take UC Berkeley, you know, which is a public institution that, ha that can only do religious studies in a certain way, right? It's not generally engaged theological work at a theological level just because being a public institution um, and all the parameters around um, religion. But when you present interreligious interreligiosity and interfaith work in ways that are not just about um, textual study, but you present it as, you know, this is what Lighthouse Mosque has been doing in partnership with the Allen Temple Baptist Church or with other interfaith or civic groups. And you present it as, oh, they were providing vaccine education um, they were providing, uh, you know, all these material needs, but also spiritual needs. When you present it as a partnership of, um, of action, you know, a, a kind of theology and action, that's heard in a very different way in, uh, amongst our colleagues in academia um, than when you're just doing strictly kind of, let's do theological reflection based on our scriptures, for example, which is very needed and very important. Um, so one of the incredible learning that's, that's, that continues to, to inform our work is how we think about interreligiosity um, uh, and uh, interfaith work in ways that are um, theology in action. And so that's, that's been really wonderful to bring that theological learning and action and work um, that's serving communities to think about um, in academic in an academic setting that allows for our colleagues to feel like that they're also learning from from these communities. Um, so that's been a real joy to to work with these communities to learn about the specific things that they do, um, the incredible work that they do, and also how it's informing how we think about scholarship 
uh, and how we think about our work in academia. Yeah, I love all the kind of layers and connections that there's all these connections to the community, to other people in academia, yeah. right? There's so much going on. Mm -hmm. um, for for other folks that kind of, you know, would maybe be interested in, in moving into this space of doing theolo theology in action, you know, or kind yep. of bridging those worlds between academia, theology, and community. Yeah. Um, what are some of the lessons you learned or advice you would share with these folks? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a, it's a really great question, especially at a time when theological education is not, you know, um, people are often unsure of what, 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 are the, what does this allow you to do in the world or how does it get you a job or, you know. Um, I, I, you know, I answer to that that there are mul absolutely abundant multiple pathways um, and that... Um, that you know, bringing your whole self um, to this is is really important. Um, we've had a lot of discussion here at the retreat about um, how academic academia often um, pushes you into this kind of compartmentalization of your academic work and your community work, um, and it you know uh, are separate, and that you you know the intellectual work and spiritual work are two separate things, and I. Um, would you know um, suggest that we we not think about it in those ways that these are um, uh, um, mutually reinforcing and that we learn from um, from bringing our whole selves to this. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are parameters in academia about what you can and can't do with religion in a, in a public university versus a private university versus. Uh, um, uh, in, a, in a seminary or in a theological uh, institution, but that I think it's really important to see that the work um, that you can do in theological education um, has impact in the world, whether it's um, uh, around you know, suffering, whether it's on aesthetics, and museums, and policy, and journalism, and media. Um, and this project has also really highlighted um, the COVID-19 grants have really highlighted that um, that we don't live in compartmentalized <laughs> ways that in fact our lived realities are much more integrated than often our disciplinary work demands of us in academia so I think it's a, it's really important that um, that people recognize you know that there is um, that it's it's about these relationships and partnerships and that it takes all of us and if anything that we've learned from um, this kind of pandemic times that we're in. Um, and I really want to hold on to it because there was a kind of optimism at the beginning of the pandemic. We're all in this together. We're all interconnected um, to a real quick fading of that. And so I want to hold on to those early moments where we are all interconnected, but we have to recognize that we're interconnected in very uneven ways. You know, um, one of the biggest learnings that's also come out of this project is that the pandemic has um, revealed and also often shown to be intensified uh, in terms of the racial and economic divides that we have um, and um, the increasing um, divides that we see between the haves and the have-nots is, is so stark and, and something that, um, uh, you know, um, I think theological education um, and um, those who are in other fields can come together to really think through together. So I want to, I'm an optimist at heart, so I, I want to bring that back to say, you know, our, our colleagues who say, oh, the intellectual has to be kept separate from the spiritual, I say it's, it's, it's together. And um, the heart and soul work has to be a huge part of everything that we do. Um, and that we have to really think about um, how to bring in communities into into our academic spaces and how academics can't just take from these communities but need to give back so it's it, it's a relationship it's a friendship it's a partnership um, and to be aware of these you know power imbalances inequities and that we all kind of move towards um, you know more just um, and compassionate world yeah, that's that's really beautiful. And too, like as you're speaking, I'm I'm thinking back to, to like I kind of hear you talking about the two big ways that like, 
kind of boundaries were broken during the pandemic, right? There was that individual level where suddenly we're seeing children, pets, mm -hmm. <laughs> homes, mm -hmm. you know, in the background of meetings. Yeah. Yes. And so very yes. much on that individual yes. <laughs> level, nothing can be siloed in the right. same way. But then also from this kind of like structural level, right, you mm -hmm. see like the boundaries that are keeping people, you know, if, if you don't have that kind of home space that yeah. you can work in, right, if yeah. you don't have access to the things you need yeah. um, to just be at home all the time, mm -hmm. right, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about kind of the work that was started or that was kind of continued mm -hmm. and, and nurtured with those organizations you had relationships with, um, what are those relationships like today? Is, is this work ongoing in any way or has it just shifted in how it looks? Yeah, thank you for that. It has very much continued in different ways. Um, uh, you know, so we, you know, so much of our work was done um, uh, through Zoom when we had the webinars, but keeping in touch with each other. And, you know, I mean, in the early days, we had food deliveries, for example, and we would have them on street corners and you drop it off, we're going to pick it up, we're going to get it to, you know, the hospitals or to um, the, uh, we, there was a lot of elder care, you know, there was a lot of uh, deliveries that were happening. So it's, it's really, um, it's really incredible to see that, you know, we had developed those partnerships and that continues in a different way now. So they, they continue to do all that work. You know, they absolutely continue to do that work. And we think about, we're still in pandemic time, times, you know, and that this is, um, that the kind of urgency is still there in a different way, you know, so there's still the unhoused, there's still people who are f food insecure. And so what does, you know, what is the learning that happens during crisis mode is that we know um, that we have an opportunity to kind of get things done very quickly in a very short amount of time, but that has to be sustained as well, right? So there's, we're seeing the burnout, we're seeing people who are like, even for us to be able to have this retreat to reflect on this has been amongst the first time that we're kind of coming at this and saying, okay, what, you know, what have, what's just happened? You know, wh what are we in and where are we going with this? So the partnerships absolutely continue um, in different ways, you know? Um, so a lot of our community partners work with each other so that's been beautiful to see all the relationships that have happened as a result of that. Um, the academic community partnerships have increased. So we've seen that. And there's a kind of move towards let's do more of this in person, you know, not just our webinars and Zoom, which has been great, which has been fantastic, but to have more in-person um, opportunities. And another part of it for us being an academic institution and uh, the Center for Islamic Studies is that we have learned also in some ways that the center, for example, can lead a lot of the interfaith, interreligious, intersectional work, right? So we've been doing that, but you know, often um, when communities come into this and different communities are at different stages um, and different histories come into this work, um, they're asked to do work that's specific to the learning that's happening in that tradition or whatnot, but to, for us to, um, also recognized, but be recognized as um, not just doing the work of the academic work of the Center for Islamic Studies, for example, at the GTU, but to be able to be leaders that serve all, you know, um, I think is really important um, uh, outcome of this, right? That we can lead that work and we can lead it for uh, everyone, but it's only done in leadership with other leaders and in partnership. Um, so, those continue. I think that we have um, a big part of our work now that feels very, that we, we're increasingly confident about is, um, and it's back to your earlier question, about theological education and its place and need in the world. You know, um, that just our other colleagues in academia who are not in th theological or religious studies um, are benefiting as much as we do from the exchange within academia as well. So it's, it's led to all sorts of conversations and partnerships that we hadn't imagined in this way. Um, we knew that they were there and, you know, so we can now come together on looking at questions of around racism, um, uh, social in inequities and inequalities around diversity and inclusion and justice, 
um, you know, around uh, policing in our communities and incarceration, um, the, you know, Bay Area, so housing is our, is a major, you know, crisis, um, the food insecure, and the fact that academic, non-academic, faith-based, non-faith-based communities are coming together um, to um, help recognize, acknowledge these uh, problems and try to problem solve together, um, I think is the work that um, a lot of, uh, that, that's the ongoing work of, uh, and the outcome of, of, of these micro-grants that have blossomed into really beautiful partnerships. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to hear you just talk about <laughs> so many different aspects and how the work continues <laughs> and um, where it's going. Um, we've reached the end of our time today. Thank um, you. So thank you again. Oh, oh um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I just want to, again, thank all our colleagues and friends who have made this retreat possible, but also our community partners who um, you know, continue to, to be in friendship. Thank you.